I am honored, truly, to have uh, our next guest, yes, um, who is uh, following the footsteps of some of your, some of your predecessors. At this. this is uh, we, uh, Wei We He, yes. and he is the CEO of HLI, or Human Longevity, mm -hmm. um, which is one of, A, our partners, and one of, I think, the most exciting companies um, uh, around. So thank you so much for thank coming you. in. Thank you, Howard. Um, as I mentioned, we had you know yeah. we had uh, Craig Venter on, who uh -huh. was uh, who was one of the founders. Um, we had David uh, Caro on, yes, uh, last year, um, and now and now it's your turn. So it's an honor to have you. That's here. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so while I was actually, let's just start off first. For those who don't know what HLI is, mm -hmm. can you just give a quick little, just explain the, the what HLI is and the power behind yeah. it. Yeah, well, HLI is really a, you know, to uh, sh uh, put it shortly, is the central intelligence agency for your house, individual's house information. So, uh, because, you know, in order to do pre preventative medicine, you need to have a lots of data on you. Because now with the genome sequencing is completed, with all the technology is available, we can collect 150 gigabytes of data from your body within three hours. And so how do we analyze that data to uh, provide you with solution to do preventative medicine or disease prevention? That's really the essence of what this company is all about. It's a, it's a lot of data. How do, yeah. how do you, so, and part of that is understanding what's noise and what's actual real That's data. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, as I was preparing for this, I was looking back at your history, your career, yeah. uh -huh. um, which is amazing. You were, so I want to start even before we get into the, the, your path in training. Yeah. What got you even interested in medicine and health? Yeah, well, that's a good question, you know. Actually, I'm going to be a little bit provocative okay, here. So we have probably about uh, over 100 people here. And we all know one thing, you know, so far nobody can change. We're all going to die, okay? You know, uh, do we have an agreement on, uh, on this uh, topic? Uh, does anybody of you here knows exactly what you are going to die of? Whoever knows about it, raise your hand. <laughs> what disease, what specific disease you are going to be die of? Nobody? Do you think your doctors know that what disease you will be die of? Okay, so, so actually, you know, I'm glad I haven't seen anybody raise their hand. They already know what disease they're going to be dying of. So, so let's keep that as a question in our you know, head. So my actually personal involvement in life sciences really started when I was about seven years old. Uh, I was growing up in China, and my parents was uh, sent to the countryside to be re-educated. So I actually grew up with my grandmother. My grandmother came home one day and was diagnosed with late-stage cervical cancer, and she died within a month of diagnosis. And I wish at the time, obviously retrospectively, I wish I knew her condition five years ahead of time. Yeah. Because clearly we all know cervical cancer is caused by a, you know, HPV viral infection. And it takes years for that virus to transform the, you know, your cervical epithelium cell and eventually create a tumor and eventually metastasize and kill you. It takes years. And there's all kinds of pre preventative medicine, including today we have a vaccine for that. Uh, so, so my interest in life sciences really started when I was very young. So my whole life is on, uh, you know, house, you know, in research and biology. And so I came to this country, wonderful country, with fifty dollars in '86 to do to 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 do my PhD. And uh, thanks to uh, President Jimmy Carter, and. Uh, uh, and I got a fellowship, and I have to be the top 50 student in China to qualify for this fellowship. So I went to Baylor College of Medicine and studied molecular biology. Actually, the first gene I ever cloned is a gene called PSA. Uh, and I then went to Mayo Clinic uh, because my whole life's interest is in research and how to turn research into solutions. So I went to Mass, uh, Mayo Clinic, where I did the early 
uh, clinical validation of PSA as a test for uh, prostate cancer. Then eventually I went to Mass General for a few years. And uh, I'm a PhD scientist, but I went to the surgical department. <laughs> okay, so, and my mentor, Pat Donahoe, is a very well-known surgeon. And uh, my trade with her is that she will teach me how to do surgery. I will teach her how to do molecular biology. By the way, after 20-some years, I'm still working with her. Uh, so I was the, the very few PhD scientists spends a day a week in the operating room as a, you know, uh, watching. I cannot cut, okay? So, <laughs> so, so. But in 1993, you know, purely by accident, I bumped into Dr. Craig Venter. So, so my relationship with uh, Dr. Venter started in 1993. So he convinced me to leave Harvard and joined with him the first large-scale genomic company called Human Genome Sciences, and HGS was started in 93. We were the first company doing large-scale DNA sequencing, buying hundreds of sequencing machines and do large-scale sequencing. And we all know that Craig eventually started another company called Celera and was the first company to decode the first human genome. So. Uh, so I, when I left Harvard, Harvard already offered me an assistant professor job, and that was like my whole life long dream is to become a Harvard professor. <laughs> uh, but Craig says, you know, uh, you know, you know, don't worry, you know, you, you know, uh, you know, uh, we're going to change the whole world, we're going to decode the genome and all that. So I actually went uh, with Craig to Maryland and started with Human Genome Sciences. Four years later, I actually. You know, that by then, HGS already went public. We were already trading about over a billion dollar market cap. I actually, one day, I suddenly had the enlightenment, enlightenment that actually startup company is one of the best vehicles to commercialize innovative life sciences ideas. Because in the university, you can write a nature paper, a science paper, you can write a, in the New England Journal of Medicine paper, but usually that's the end of it. Uh, in a startup company, you can form a group of people and raise enough money, and you can commit to a particular product or service and really go for it. So ever since that realization, I have been building companies. So I built my own company, Origin. I have started my own VC fund, ETP, which has funded about 70-some biotech companies. So one of the reasons we got involved in HRI coming back, or you know, 360 degrees, uh, is I went to see Craig uh, in 2015, mm -hmm. and Craig said, you know, I'm starting a new company called Human Longevity, and I think that's the round you guys invested. Yes, it is. So we put in 40 million dollars into it in the Series B. That's how I got on the board of Human Longevity because longevity is always something deep in my heart. And so we got committed to human longevity, and then I got on the board, and then a year later, you know, uh, I think the company really, you know, all life sciences company burn money like crazy. Yeah. Uh, a year later, nobody wants to invest in HLI anymore. So we are the only one willing to put additional money into it. So now I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I'm, I'm the only CEO pays zero salary. So. Uh, anybody come to negotiate with me about their salary, say, I will set the example for you. <laughs> okay, so, so, so that's, how, and that's how I got involved in HLI. How's that for honesty, <laughs> right? I mean, how often do you hear that? True yeah. honesty. Yeah. Um, that's wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, so now that you joined, so now you're running HLI. Uh -huh. um, can you tell, so part of the thing that I'm fascinated about, for, well, first off, let me uh -huh. just say, um, I think that the story um, of your grandmother uh -huh. um, really, in, especially in today's day and age, shows us that there is so much that we can do both yeah. in technology, but uh, like we were talking with Dean, is preventative medicine, just small changes. But as you mentioned, there's, a, there's an HPV vaccine yeah. that literally, if we make sure it gets out to people, can really change... Absolutely. Yeah. the face of yeah. cervical cancer and head and neck cancers yeah. around the world. And we mm -hmm. really yeah. um, are a global community. Yeah. I'm sorry, Absolutely. this is a, one, of, one of my passions, is making sure that it's not just in the United States or in China or in countries that can afford it, but we really owe it to 
everyone that we get these vaccines Absolutely. out yes. all over. Yeah. So sorry, that was just a, yeah. a side note that I know yeah. that it's probably a, a passion of yours too. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, with HLI, um, one of your products, Health Nucleus. Yes. Um, as, can you just share with everybody what the different, what, first off, what Health Nucleus is? Yeah. And I just wanted to see if you could compare and contrast it a little bit to what our current healthcare system yes. is like. Yes. Well, you know, I'm a big believer in preventative medicine. And uh, this is why I keep asking people, do you know the disease uh, you will be, you know, dying of? You know, for my grandmother, you know, maybe a year before her death, you know, if we knew about her condition, it's probably a curable disease. Uh, so the house nucleus really is, you know, in the layman's term, you can think about it as the male Clinic executive house except the Mayo Clinic executive house still don't do whole genome sequencing, still doesn't do whole body MRI. We are using the absolute bleeding edge technology to collect 150 gigabytes of data on you uh, and do uh, AI machine learning and analytic to do disease pr prediction. You know, for instance, we have a dementia model, probably is gonna get a 510K approval. So we can approve, we can predict what's your dementia risk. And I'll give you a few anecdotal examples. Uh, there's actually a PNS paper coming out on the first uh, 1,200 patients. So we already done 5,000 patients. These are not patients, these are people came to our clinic. They're healthy, they, they think they're healthy. But the reality is the PNS paper will show you in you know, a week or two, 2% of them already have you know, cancer in their body. They don't know about it. 2% uh, people has brain aneurysm. Uh, and 40% uh, of people have high liver fat and metabolic, pre-metabolic you know, metabolic diseases. I'll give you one example. And sometimes you know, when a physician tells you, you know, your blood sugar is slightly higher, uh, doesn't mean anything. We, we usually don't take action because you don't feel anything. You know, uh, you know your, your liver fat is at the 5%. What does that mean? So for me, you know, I already, you know, after I become the chairman of this company, I said I better look at my data and carefully. It turned out to be if when I look at my brand MRI, there's already these why matters in my brand which is caused by the collapse of the micro blood vessel due to slightly elevated uh, you know, blood sugar level. And, but my, uh, fat, my liver fat is 5.7, my visceral fat is 5.7, five some liters. So it's actually the brand image really convinced me that I have to take action. So in the last six months, I lost 10 kilograms well, I, I have a lot of resources. I caught for, up. For the Americans, yes. how many pounds is that? It's about yeah. 22, 23 pounds, right? So I lost, you know. But I have a lot of resources. I actually did it a very easy way. You know, I caught up my uh, professor, you know, my, uh, somebody I know really well at the Harvard School of Public Health. He's one of the best metabolic scientists, and uh, Toby. And he said, Wei Wu, I give you a solution. You know, you cut down a little bit of your carb and then mm -hmm. do one day intermittent fasting every week. So I followed his procedure. I lost, you know, 20 some pounds in no time. And then I went back to our MRI machine. My liver fat already dropped down to 2.5%. My I lost 1.5 liters of visceral fat. Wow. Okay, and my hemoglobin 1AC went from 6.5 down to 5.3. So so you can take action on your health, but the most difficult part of health data is sometimes it's difficult to convince people the, 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 heart, the, 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 the art of persuasion. You know, I always use it an example. The people who work with me at Human Longevity, they always hear about this. You know, I don't know if you guys ever heard about Dr. Samuel Weiss. The guy first proved to people that gynecologists should wash their hand to decrease women's death rate at birth by 20%. But that paper, using a lot of data, took 50 years to convince medical community to wash their hand. How many women have died because their physician didn't wash their hand? 
it took 50 years. The guy actually died in the, inside, you know, in the insane asylum, okay, before the, his medical practice was accepted by the medical community. But if today I tell you that, you know, hey, everyone should cut the, your liver fat by, you know, 30%, you know, some people will listen, some people won't, okay? So how do we create enough data, right? So the power of data is really, I think, the essence of HLI. Because we, I personally think, you know, uh, you know, anybody had a baby before, you know, when the baby is born, we usually do a blood collection on your knee, and you historically you only test two genetic disease, mm -hmm. but with you know with <clears> the <throat> genomic technology, you can do using the same cost, pretty soon, to have all 20,000 genetic disease tested uh, in the future. And I truly believe, you know, although our current service for HLI is pretty expensive, I'm a big believer in 10 years to collect 100 gigabytes of data on you know, anybody in the whole world, uh, 7 billion people is going to be less than $1,000. And you only need to do your genome once in your life. You don't need to do it over and over again. With that information, you can really come up with a low-cost solution to do predictive medicine. And some people have cervical cancer risk, some, you know, like Angelina Jolie, she's born with a BRCA1 mutation, so she has a high risk factor for breast cancer. So you, you need to know about it. Some people are carrying, you know, cholesterol uh, genes. So I'll give you one example. There's, we have a 50-some-year-old <coughs> people come into our clinic, and his father died of a heart attack. His grandfather died of a stroke and his cholesterol level is sky high. The physician keeps telling him to take Lipitor and exercise, but after he done that, his cholesterol level is still high. So after the genomic analysis, we immediately find out this patient has a PC, PCS, uh, PCSK9 gene mutation, which is actually inherited in his family. So he, his body has a totally different metabolic mutation which creates a high cholesterol level. And we all know that there is a monoclonal antibody drug. Uh, you know, you take one shot, your cholesterol level will go down on PCSK9 gene. There's actually also a, you know, kind of a holistic medicine. If you take the Indian turmeric, a turmeric target is actually PCSK9. So if you want to be a little bit, in, uh, you know, uh, less invasive, uh, instead of taking a monoclonal antibody, you can take high dose of turmeric. Yeah. But now there's actually even an sRNA molecule just approved by FDA. It's one shot a year, your, your cholesterol level will go down. So she, because we know this genetic information about this particular patient, he can avoid his father's fate of dying of a heart attack at, in, in his 50. He can avoid his grandfather's fate of dying in a, uh, by a stroke in his 50, uh, because he probably will you know, live a very normal life with, uh, you know, uh, because of this monoclonal antibody or this sRNA therapy that, uh, you know, we, because we know about his genetic information. Better yet, he can know every son, his son and da daughter whether we need to do even earlier prevention for, uh, you know, for cardiovascular disease because this patient already have a calcium score of 110, which basically he already did a little bit damage to his, uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, vessel. So this is really, you know, when we put all that gigabytes of data together we can do wonders in the future. Yeah. So, I mean, this really, it's cutting edge precision medicine yes, is exactly. really what it is, yeah. right? And the power, I think, is really, as you said, mm -hmm. um, it's not just collecting one or two or 1,500 uh -huh. yeah. people. It's collecting uh, a global yeah. uh, amount of data yeah. that you can really do true predictive medicine at a personalized level. So the power of HLI is yeah. just going to increase and increase absolutely. The, the longer and yes. the more patients you get. Yes, yes. absolutely. Well, you know, for example, you, know, you will see we're actually about to make an announcement on acquisition of a company called DoctorForMe.ai. And DoctorForMe actually just announced last week a formal collaboration with Mass General Hospital. So actually, as a patient, 
if we have all the data on you, finding the right physician is actually crit crit are critically important. You know, I give you one example. Uh, you know, people think lung cancer is one disease, but lung cancer is probably a hundred different diseases, or maybe a thousand different diseases. If you are a small cell lung cancer patient has an ALK mutation, there's drug like Zarkori you can take, or there's a, if you are a small cell lung cancer patient has a NRTK mutation, FDA just approved the drug you know last year for just specifically for NRTK mutation. So if you are a lung cancer patient, you went to a physician for his whole life has only been using chemotherapy, you know, you may die after two months of chemotherapy because the doctor is, you know, has their own momentum. They, they don't always learn the latest thing because they may not know the NRTK mutation approval in 2019 by FDA. So, but if you know your mutation, if you have an NTK, an N RTK mutation, then I would actually send you to a doctor at Mass General actually did the phase three clinical trial on NRTK. Your likelihood of surviving five years uh, is gonna increase dramatically uh, versus if you just randomly went to a chemotherapy uh, doctor. So this is actually the platform we are establishing is how to use data to make you live longer and healthier. Ideally, you know, in Chinese medicine, there's always a saying, the best doctor is their patient never gets sick, okay? But the, those doctors never get famous because people only get famous <laughs> if they treated the terminal patient and they, they got, you know, 2% of the patient alive again. So if you're a doctor, your patient never gets sick. You're actually not gonna be famous but you will save a lot of lives. That's what HLI is really for. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that is great. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you, because truly, as uh, I mentioned with Dean, you know, we at Startup Health, first off, we're so excited to be partnered with yeah. you guys in, in this vision of changing longevity, making yeah. sure, again, that people live long, healthy lives. And I think the key is, exactly, personalized medicine yeah. and prevention. That's right. If we, if we prevent it, then I think we're all going to be, be happy. Yes. So thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Round of applause. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.